First, I'll give a brief overview of our presentation. We'll start with the problem statement, our project goals. We'll be explaining to you how we built our model using fundamentals as well as COMSOL, our model, uh, what our model predicts, as well as uh, how we built our test machine and our prototype testing results. And we'll also tell you about our next steps and recommendations. So Moore's law states that uh, uh, the number of transistors on a chip will double approximately every two years. And this increase in transistors obviously will increase the heat generation that is apparent in our computers today. This poses a huge problem on cooling, which uh, on both corporate computers and servers. So people everywhere is uh, trying to improve different aspects of heat management. Uh, on the bottom right, you see uh, thermal paste, which is used to improve the conductivity between, let's say, a CPU and a cooling block. On the top right, we have an uh, example of someone trying to use a phase change cooling system on a personal computer. And corporate uh, companies even go as far as submerging their entire server systems in ethylene glycol for better cooling. So our group uh, is, attempting, uh, is trying to develop an uh, innovative cooling uh, fluid using metal oxide nanoparticles, specifically aluminum oxide uh, dispersed in water. It's been shown that uh, nanoparticles uh, improve the thermal conductivity uh, of the fluid when dispersed in water. On the left, we have a typical uh, fluid cooling system using water. Um, and on the right, we have a graph showing the effectiveness of nanofluids using, uh, as used as a coolant. So the primary goal of our project is to design a system using nanofluid that would have a drop in temperature of approximately 2 degrees Celsius when compared to uh, a water system. So our temperature would be the CPU core. Uh, we had a flow rate of about 30 gallons per hour. Our CPU would be operating at a full, capacity, at full load, which is about 250 watts of heat generation. We'll be using a cooling block uh, made by Bits Power. So some of our other goals include compatibility with uh, conventional cooling systems. Uh, we would like the fluid, obviously, to have long-term stability uh, to be dispersed and not agglomerate in the system. It should be safe for home use without any special safety equipment. And it should also have no corrosive effects on metals and no microbial growth within the system. So with those goals in mind, we set out to build our model from the fundamental properties. Um, we had to determine all of the fundamental characteristics of our fluid, starting with viscosity. Um, the viscosity of water can be determined simply from this equation which relates temperature with the viscosity. And from there, the viscosity of nanofluid can be determined using Einstein's relation, which is valid for fine particles below 10% volume fraction, which uh, is what we expect. Phi there stood for uh, volume fraction. So it's a very simple equation. The next property that we need to determine is density. Uh, liquid density can be determined using the equation on the slide. Um, and with a known volumetric temperature expansion coefficient for water, we know the water density at any temperature. Um, and from there, nanofluid density overall is simply a volume average of uh, aluminum oxide and water, respectively. Uh, the third fundamental property is heat capacity. Um, heat capacity of aluminum oxide nanoparticles in particular have been studied in 2008, and this is the model that this research group has come up with. Um, here they relate the heat capacity and densities of the nanoparticle aluminum oxide um, and water respectively, to determine the heat capacity of the nanofluid. And the final and most important um, property is thermal conductivity. In 2005, the pressure research group um, modeled the heat conductivity of nanofluid uh, within solution. And using very many different uh, properties of the nanofluid and the, I mean, of the fluid matrix and the nanoparticle, respectively, as well as um, how they interact, such as the Reynolds number of the flow between the water and the nanoparticle. So this model is um, 
accurate as shown by the, their graph that they have here comparing the model with um, various experimental results. We wanted to further verify the model accuracy. Um, so we compared the model results with multiple literature sources from a review paper by Timo Fiva in 2007. Um, the average percent error, which is outlined, I mean, all the percent errors are shown in the table on the left. Um, the average is around 6.2%, which is consistent with pressure, uh, the graph shown before. So we have um, very solid fundamental equations showing the properties of the nanofluid, and we will be using it in our COMSOL simulations, which Andy. So in order to accurately, accurately predict uh, what volume fractions of uh, nanoparticle, uh, nanoparticles to water we need, we need to build a COMSOL model of our entire system. Um, so starting from uh, the pump, uh, this will uh, pump the nanofluid through the flow meter where the flow rate can be measured. It will be uh, pumped into the heating block where the heat transfer from the block to the fluid will occur. Uh, as it goes on into the radiator where the heated nanofluid is cooled uh, using a fan that's uh, attached to the radiator. Finally, uh, the fluid goes back into the reservoir and back into the pump. The temperatures are measured um, the input temperature of the heating block is measured, the output, as well as the core temperature of the CPU is measured. So uh, in, in both these diagrams here, uh, it's a diagram of our CPU cooling block. So on the left, we see that on the bottom we have the base plate, which it comes in direct contact with the CPU. Above that, above that we have fins, which uh, form channels between the fins. The fins are approximately two millimeters in height. And above that, we have an impingement plate, which uh, completely encloses the channels which the nanofluid flows through. On the right, we have a top view of our CPU cooling block. The top circle is the inlet, and the bottom circle is the outlet. Um, fluid flows directly downwards uh, into the inlet through the channels around the CPU cooling block and back up through the outlet. As you can see, uh, the complexity of the CPU cooling block uh, leads us uh, to very difficult uh, processing in, in COMSOL. So we decided that we should instead only uh, model a unit cell of this uh, CPU cooling block. On the left diagram, you see dotted lines that indicate uh, the unit cell on that uh, section. And uh, the length of our CPU, uh, of the channel is only half of the CPU cooling block due to the, symmet uh, the symmetricalness of our block. So this is the COMSOL model that we built. On the bottom, the gray area is uh, a material made of silicon, which represents our CPU. Above that, we have uh, the CPU cooling block, indicated in orange, which is made of copper. The light blue is our fluid, and the rectangular orange is, uh, block is our uh, radiator. So heat is generated from the CPU cooling block, uh, from the uh, CPU, uh, which is transferred up the cooling block into the nanofluid, which flows uh, outwards into the radiator, and the heat is dissipated only from the radiator. Keep in mind that this is a closed loop system, so uh, one, of the one of the rules we set is that the outlet temperature is equal to the inlet temperature, and we ran the system to steady state. So there are some sources of error with this model. Uh, we have only have a generalized uh, model of, of our radiator, which is indicated by the block. Um, the surfaces are perfectly insulated, which means that, uh, which isn't indic uh, which doesn't represent our prototype. Uh, the, there's, the pump is also a source of heat, which we did not consider. And pr finally, the system is not perfectly symmetrical, so it's not, uh, its model of our CPU cooling block is not uh, completely accurate. However, our model, uh, as shown later, accurately predicts the temperatures of our computer system. So now that we have our model, um, what do we input as the parameters into, uh, into our model? Um, from, the parameter, from the characteristics of the nanofluid that Vance stated before, um, we've developed uh, these graphs using MATLAB. Um, as you can see, as the diameter decreases in size, the thermal conductivity coefficient K uh, increases exponentially. Also, the volume fraction of the nanoparticles to water also has a linear relation, uh, sort of linear relationship with the thermal conductivity. So here we have the uh, temperature profile of our model run at steady state. 
as expected, you can see that uh, the, since the heat source is coming from is, is the CPU, we see that the, temper the hottest point of the entire system is also on the CPU, which reaches about 48 degrees Celsius. The average temperature of the CPU block is about 45 degrees Celsius. So using both COMSOL and MATLAB, we've determined uh, various volume fractions that we need to meet our project goal of two degrees Celsius drop. As you can see, the lower, the, the smaller the particle size, the less uh, volume fraction that we need for our fluid. So we considered three different particles, um, 20 nanometer, 40 nanometer, and 150 nanometer aluminum oxide nanoparticles. Um, the 20 nanometer nanoparticles were out of budget, and the 150 nanometer nanoparticles were um, out of stock, unfortunately. So we were left with the 40 nanometer particles from Alpha Acer to test with. We built this machine um, to test. The nanoparticle solution is white in the tubing. Um, it goes from the reservoir to the pump to the CPU to the radiator through the flow meter and back into the reservoir. Um, you can see there are two temperature sensors um, at the bottom which measure the inlet and outlet temperature um, through the CPU heating block. And uh, the CPU also has an internal temperature sensor which can be measured using software. So with the flow meter, these temperature sensors um, we can fully characterize the, our um, fluid flow. In our initial testing, um, there was no temperature difference. Uh, water, our prototype, and a competitor's fluid all had around 43 degrees as their steady state temperature. Keep in mind, this is um, very close to what our model predicted um, as 45 degrees Celsius. However, this, because there's no discrepancy, the cause of the, no, uh, of the lack in discrepancy between these um, samples is due to the higher flow rate than expected. We had around 90 gallons per hour flow rate rather than 30, which was outlined in one of the first slides. Um, in order to match the results of a 30 gallons per hour um, flow rate, you would either have to increase the heat output, lower, or increase the heat output of the um, heating block or CPU, lower the heat output or dissipation from the radiator, or lower the flow rate. In the end, we ran the test without a radiator fan, effectively lowering the heat dissipation from the radiator. Uh, the results showed in the graph here, it's hard to see, but red is water and green and blue are the, our fluid and the competitor fluid respectively. After adjusting for room temperature, there is approximately a one degree difference between our nanofluid and water. And our product performed on par with our competitor's product. So unfortunately, the two degrees Celsius um, decrease that we set out at the beginning was not met. And that was, um, there were a few causes that we, uh, that we determined. First, as I mentioned, was flow rate, which was three times higher than expected. Um, if we had a working flow rate controller, we'd be able to decrease the flow rate and we would get the results we'd expect. Uh, also, viscosity was higher than expected. Um, this was because we were at the limits of the Einstein relation um, that was used to estimate it. If we were to uh, alter our model to have a more accurate model for viscosity, for example, um, we expect our model and our test machine to be uh, very reliable and um, predictable. So it's with our solid model and our um, solid test machine, we foresee that there are many further tests that we can do. Um, for example, we can test at lower flow rates 
as mentioned, or higher over, overvolted uh, CPU and GPU systems for higher heat generation. Um, this will s provide more pronounced differences between our nanofluid and water. Um, also, we could test different nanoparticles. Zinc oxide, for example, is, could be cheaper and also provide significant temperature reductions. Um, we could test different sizes and concentrations to op optimize properties even further. And in the end, we could develop a nanoparticle synthesis process for potentially cheaper and more customizable nanoparticle properties. In the end, we're confident and excited in our results, and we're looking forward to see where this technology can take us in the future. Thank you. Well, um, the fins were out of the scope of our project. Um, so what's the business case for that, for your competitor, so to speak? Uh, I, I'm, I don't fully understand, okay, I'm sorry. Your competitor is marketing with nanofluid. So presumably the fat competitor is saying, you should use our nanofluid instead of getting finer fins because, you know, that, um, that Yes, so we're, we're comparing these uh, fluids based on uh, one set of, uh, just a fixed set of cooling blocks. So yes, you can improve uh, various other aspects of our cooling system, like the fins, maybe uh, a better radiator, uh, that all plays into uh, cooling the system. But we're only looking at specifically the fluid, uh, how the fluid can better improve our system. Uh, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> like you could probably see uh, maybe a two degrees difference will increase your CPU lifetime by a, a significant portion, maybe. Very